I want to start with uh, and talk about uh, the last conclusion from uh, Joey's talk. Joey's, to J Joey's last uh, con conclusion was that we need to figure out how to build non von Neumann uh, structures. And uh, this is the target of, uh, of this talk. I'm not going to answer that, but I'm going to show a few more questions about that. Um, but before that, I want to go back to the von Neumann structure. I'm not the first one to talk about that here, but we know that there is a big problem in the von Neumann structure, the von, bon von Neumann bottleneck, which is basically the need to move the data. We need to move data between the CPU and the memory, and this is a huge problem in terms of performance, because going off chip is at, it is at least 200 uh, clock cycles as compared to the CPU uh, si uh, frequency. But not only that, it's a huge energy problem. And uh, Anu Mutlu yesterday presented a slide from Bill Daly's talk that talked about 1,000 uh, times more energy to move data than to compute. And I'm, going to, I'm showing here different numbers from the same group. This is a, is a work that I was involved in, in at Stanford. And uh, so the numbers are slightly different, but it's just because we used 16-bit and not 64-bit, but it's still three orders of magnitude difference between computation and data movement. So the conclusion is that we want to reduce the data movement. So we don't want to move the data around. We just want to compute it. And in order to solve that, we can think about two different approaches. One is to focus on the CPU and move the data close to the processing and build a smarter memory hierarchy, also known as caches, and uh, put the things in the cache in a smart way to, to reduce the amount of data transfer or to compute in a different way in order to, need, to reduce the need to go to the memory. So that's one approach. Still doesn't solve the problem, but can reduce it. A different approach is to move the computation into the memory. And this is also something that was presented yesterday, and actually, even yesterday it was told, that it's from the 70s, mostly as that was done in the 90s, but uh, many attempts, even from recent years, uh, to move the processing into the memory, what uh, is usually called as PIM, processing in memory, but the, all, of the, of, all of the previous attempts were not really processing in the memory, but processing near the memory. Because at the end, the, all of these attempts were by moving some of the processing units close to the memory. So we had a memory, usually DRAM, and CMOS-based processing units. And uh, the amount of data transfer uh, is lower because the, 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 the distances are lower. But so instead of three orders of magnitude more energy, it became one or two orders of magnitude more energy. But it's still the same bot von, bottle, uh, von, bo von Neumann bottleneck, still the same problem. We are going to talk about a different way, a real processing in the memory, real computation in the memory, where we give the, the memory cells, the cells that store the data, also computation capabilities. So we can completely eliminate the need to move the data, because where the data is located is also where the data is processed. Not nearby, but in the same cell. So if blue represents data storage and orange represents computation, since we use the same memory cells, we can turn the blue into orange, and since they are just the same cells, it's just a matter of decision if we, we use the cells to compute or to store. And throughout the, the execution of a program, we can just change it, and we call this unit, instead of a memory, a memory processing unit, MPU, memory processing unit. But unfortunately, we can't use conventional memory cells like DRAM or SRAM to compute. So we need to move to a different technology that will enable this kind of approach. And emerging memory technologies can actually uh, enable that. So with emerging memory technologies, such as the ones that we saw in this workshop, we can store data and compute using the same cells. 
So when I talk about imagined memory technologies, and we saw talks about all of these technologies, it can be resistive RAM, it can be phase change memory. STTM RAM might be more complicated in order to use the same cells uh, without changing them, but definitely resistive RAM and phase change memory can do that. And uh, in order to understand how, how we are going to do that, I will focus on bipolar resistive, uh, resistive RAM or memory store. Um, and, but actually, we can do that with other technologies. But in order to understand that, we will assume that we are working with bipolar resistive RAM. So just in order to, to make sure that everyone understands the, the behavior of this, uh, this uh, cell, basically, we have a memory store. When current flows into one direction, the resistance drops. If current flows to the other direction, the resistance increases. And if the current is if we don't have current or the current is below a certain threshold, the resistance is unchanged, so it's practically stored the data below the threshold. And with this device, we can compute in many different ways, and we are working on different ways to do that, different logic families. I'm going to focus on the middle one called magic, memory store added logic, but as you can see, in the bottom here, we published a lot of papers of other techniques as well. And uh, what is magic? So this is the basic magic NOR gate. We have two input memory stores. So the initial uh, value in the memory store, the initial resistance of the input memory stores is the input. High resistance is 0. Low resistance is 1. The output is the final resistance of the output memory store. So the behavior of the, of the logic gate is by initializing the output to a known value, to logic 1, or low resistance, and then apply a fixed voltage, that by this applied voltage we will have current flows from the high voltage to the ground, and because of the connectivity, the resistance of the output memory store will either increase or remain unchanged, depending on whether the, the applied uh, current is above the threshold or below the threshold, this will basically make the, the computations that we want a no Boolean function. So let's see how it works. If both inputs are logical zero, high resistance says, and when we apply the, the voltage, it is a voltage divider, high resistance versus low resistance. So most of the voltage will be applied on the input memory stores. So in total, the current that will flow, or the applied voltage across the output memory store, will be very low, almost zero, way below the threshold. So the output won't change and will remain in logical one. In any other case, at least one of the input memory stores is in low resistance. So when we apply the voltage, at least half of the voltage will be across the output memory store. So now it will be sufficient to switch the device. So we will get high resistance or logical zero. So this is exactly the truth table of a NOR gate. So magic, uh, magic uh, NOR gate works at least in the animation, right? But it's not only in the animation. Actually, it works in reality. On the left side, you can see a paper that was, re that was recently published from a group in KAIST in Korea that they presented how they performed a single uh, standalone uh, gay, uh, logic with magic. And you can see here NOT, which is one input NOR gate, and NOR gates with magic. And on the right side, you can see a picture from our lab of a test chip that we uh, have developed together with Winbond. Uh, so magic works in real hardware as well. And taking this uh, logic gate and just looking on the, the schematic of the gate and following the different connections, see the colors, it looks exactly the way that we put memory stores in an array. So we can take the gate and put it inside a memory array. So a memory array based on bipolar memory stiff switches is actually can be used for storage because it's a memory array, 
but can also, just by applying external voltages, can be used for computation. So it's real computation in the memory without changing or moving the data around. And not only that, by applying the external voltages in the columns, we can perform it also in parallel on other rows. So it's also a vector operation, SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. We can parallelize the computation, and also we know how to isolate cells, so we can actually select rows that we want to compute, and deselect the rows that we don't want to compute. So we know how to do magic NOR, and NOR is a complete logic function, so we can, based on magic NOR, can basically compute any other uh, uh, logical operations that we want to do, and uh, one of the things that we're doing is to develop different algorithms to compute different, uh, different functions, including matrix multiplication or convolution. And with that, we can take the memory array, and just by selecting cells, let's say that in these cells we have the number A and the number B, and just by uh, applying different voltages in the periphery, we can perform a function and store the result immediately inside the memory. So we don't have the von Neumann bottleneck of read the data and then store it back into the memory. Everything is done in situ inside the memory. And uh, we can also do that for many, many uh, rows in parallel. So we can perform vector operations. And the nice thing about the vector operations is that we just have the same number of computational steps. So the performance is independent on the size of the vector. Performing a no operation on one row or performing a no operation on a vector of million rows is still one operation. It takes just one cycle, even if it's a one million vector size. So with that, we can build the memristive MPU, memristive memory processing unit. It will get from a host processor a command to compute, let's say, to add two numbers, so two vectors, so we have the two vector, vector A and vector B, stored in the memory, as data that is stored in the memory, and the processor will send a command to add these two vectors into a certain location in the memory, and the controller of the MMPU will translate the, the command from the CPU into a set of NOR operations. Let's assume that the perf the, in order to perform that, we need four NOR operations. And these four NOR operations are represented by different colors. So in the first cycle, we will have the yellow NOR operations because we select and deselect certain cells. And then we will have the purple NOR operations. And then we will have the green set of NOR operations. And at the last state, last stage of the blue and, uh, set of NOR operations, the result will be stored inside the array without the need to move the data into the location of the vector C. So everything is done there. So we have the, the basic structure, right? We have a CPU and we have the MMPU, and, uh, and we want to design the system for that. And now I'm going back to Joy's question on how to do that, how to have a non-von Neumann architecture. And, and a lot of questions were raised from that, a uh, big question, okay? We need first to understand how to build the memory. It's an emerging memory technology, right? It's not really allowed to build the memory. And we also need to think how to distribute the data, how to distribute the memory arrays, banks, uh, ETC, these kind of th things. And besides that, we need to design the controller. Actually, the controller, that's the real brain of the system because the controller takes a complicated operation and makes it a sequence of no operations. So we want to design the controller and uh, we invest a lot of effort in order to make it with efficient algorithms, a low number of sets of, of operations of uh, no operations. And with, uh, also, we want to develop the, the interface between the CPU and the MMPU, right? The programming model, how a program will be represented, what portion of the program will be inside the CPU, and what portion will be in MMPU. So this is about the software as well. And 
Lastly, we need to understand what applications will benefit out of that, because some applications have, let's say, not a, a small uh, data, uh, uh, amount of data that is being processed with high locality. So caches, for example, are very, very efficient. Some of them are not. So we need, we, we need applications that will benefit with the mass, from the massive parallelism and the poor data locality, basically. Uh, so just to give you some uh, sense of the, 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 the profits that we can get, the benefits we, that we can get from MMPU, so these are just preliminary results from convolution uh, with, uh, with MMPU. And you can see here, this is a, 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 a comparison with a PMEM. That's a, a, a basically an architecture from, a, from last micro that was published last time, last micro, based on a CPU. It's a, it's a work from NVIDIA based on the CPU and, the, and, and the, an efficient memory subsystem for convolution. And you can see that by in, the, in terms of performance, we get 2.5 to 4x improvement in the performance. And even more importantly, in, en in energy, it's three orders of magnitude better energy because we don't move the data. So it is extremely energy efficient and also with better performance. So the advantages are enormous. So to conclude my talk, we saw that using emergent memory technologies enable non-von Neumann architectures. And the MMPU will give us the real processing in the memory. We can really solve the von Neumann bottleneck by processing the metadata inside the memory and not nearby. And once we'll finish the entire system design of that and solving the, all the questions that were raised from, from, from this uh, problem, we can benefit orders of magnitude uh, improvement, both in terms of performance and in terms of energy. So there is huge advantage of doing that. So with that, I want to thank first the students that did the, uh, the hard work of the research and also are doing a lot of hard work in organizing the, and helping in the organization of this workshop. So I want to thank them and thank you.